having talked about uh, Sigmund Freud's proposition, today we are going to begin with the concepts proposed by the neo Freudians. So, let us first begin with Alfred Adler. Adler's proposition is uh, named as individual psychology and the major concepts that he talked about were mastery, power, superiority and status. Okay. Things which human beings largely look for, you want to master something, you want to acquire more and more power, uh, you want to be extremely superior and you are very co uh, much conscious about your status. But then the major focus that Alfred Adler was putting was on inferiority complex and then he said that basically inferiority is something which is innate and universal. So, all of us okay, have certain degree of inferiority complex within us and he says that we adopt two types of mechanisms, either we compensate for those inferiorities that we uh, uh, experience or sometimes we even go for overcompensating them and it is this inferiority complex, he says which finally makes us strive for superiority and upward drive. So, I realize my limitation, I realize that I am inferior on certain parameters as compared to others and then what I do, I strive you know, towards upward movement, I try to overcome it, I compensate it okay. and in that process I become more and more superior. But I must tell you uh, that this very superiority, the concept that Adler talked about, initially the term he used was masculine protest and he said that a striving to be stronger and powerful as a compensation for feeling of being inferior and unmanly is something that uh, you know uh, is what he defined as muscular protest. In 1912, he replaced masculine protest uh, with the term striving for superiority and later on it was replaced as striving for success or perfection. So, he by and large supported the Freudian viewpoint, but the addition that Adler made to uh, this uh, psychoanalytic approach was the concept of inferiority complex and the upward drive that the individual shows and overall trying to achieve mastery, power, superiority and status in life. Another important concept that uh, Adler talked about was the ordinal position of the child, means uh, what is the position in the birth order okay, that your parents have, whether you are the first child, second child, third child, lone child and so forth. So, Adler said that if somebody is the first born child, he or she gets the undivided attention of both the parents. Okay. Now, experience of traumatic experiences of the thornment when a new baby is born. So, you enjoyed the status as a first born baby, you got undivided attention and then comes the second baby in life okay. and this becomes a traumatic experience because you realize that you are being removed from the status that you enjoyed. If somebody is a second born child, second child in the family, okay, then these children are more and more achievement oriented this is Adler's concept and if somebody is the last born child, okay, they are at risk of being problem children. They have a strong feeling of inferiority and they lack independence. They are highly motivated to surpass elder siblings, achievement oriented and they are very, very competition minded according to Adler. And interestingly, Adler goes to the extent of explaining what happens if you are the only child in the family. He says that these children have inflated self concept and exaggerated sense of superiority. They become too dependent on their caregivers, they lack feeling of cooperation and they also lack social interest. So, I would summarize that say uh, besides accepting the fact that there is something unconscious and uh, the other prime proposition of psychoanalytic framework, Adler's major concept was defining uh, not the ordinal position of the child, but basically talking about the uh, inferiority complex and how this compensation and overcompensation of this very complex finally leads to uh, attainment of a superior position. Another psychoanalyst 
who gave uh, you know, a major uh, leap to the entire psychoanalytic framework was Carl Gustav Jung. Jung talked about the complexes and the proposition that he gave is called analytical psychology. He said that complexes are basically a network of ideas which are brought together by common set of emotions and feelings. According to Jung, collective unconscious basically uh, has the past experience of the human race. It consists of the primordial images that include memory traces of human past as well as the pre-human and the animal ancestry that we share. He says that many types of myths, legends and religious beliefs are stored in our collective unconscious. And the complexes that we have are individualized and constitute content of personal unconscious. And he did also talk about the archetype and he said that archetypes are generalized and they constitute contents of collective unconscious. So, basically uh, one of the elements of unconscious he says that is the collective unconscious which primarily is uh, something which we have borrowed from our pre-human uh, stage. Okay. And this is something that we all share our common past experience as a human race. But then Jung also talks about the personal unconscious and he says that personal unconscious basically develops out of any of the individual's conscious experiences which he or she tries to repress. Okay. Uh, in psychology you would find a very nice explanation of the process of expression, suppression and repression. Expression of course is a free expression of what you feel within, what you think of. Suppression is when you know what you think, you know what you feel, but you do not overtly express it. Then psychology will say that you are suppressing that very idea. Repression is a very interesting concept. Repression is the thought, the feeling that you uh, know, put a cap on right at the time of germination. So, as an individual, you yourself do not know what you you know visualize or what you feel about a given thing simply because you have put a black box in it over it. So, the repressed content is never known to the individual whereas, the suppressed contents we are aware of it. So, he talks about repression and he says that because it is unconscious therefore, the individual conscious experiences when it is repressed it adds to your unconscious because you have repressed it therefore, it will not be consciously available to you. Now, according to Jung, personal unconscious basically consists of the repressed infantile memories, forgotten events or subliminally perceived experiences okay? and therefore, it varies from person to person and is very unique to the individual concern. Why? because our infantile experiences would be very, very different. As a child, I might have experienced something else compared to you and what I and you have experienced as a child might be different from the third individual. And because uh, no, these are part of infantile memories, it is not available to us, okay. but it does uh, no, haunt us according to Jung and therefore, uh, variation in the infantile stage uh, no, creates whole lot of repressed infantile memories. Okay then certain events that we have forgotten, okay, they constitute the unconscious element and then some type of experiences which we subliminally perceived means the full blown perceptual uh, process did not take place okay, and we experienced it. Now, it goes to our unconscious state and because if you make a mix of the uh, infantile state of uh, memory the forgotten events and the subliminal experiences, then this combination you know, makes us too much varied from each other. Then uh, Jung says that the content of personal unconscious basically they are complexes and he in fact uh, the test, the word association test that he developed was to bring forth these complexes. Then he talked about individuation, the method by which uh, each of us become very distinct from each other. Then Jung uh, now talks about the archetype and two famous archetypes he talked about was the anima and the animus archetype. Besides that, he talked about self, 
persona and shadow as other archetypes. If you have a female in the male body, so physically uh, one is male, but behaviorally you know you find a female in that male that is anima. Archetype where you find that somebody is female physically, but has you know what you think of uh, malely qualities, then it is male in the female what you referred as animus. Anima animus archetype you now is the most popular that you will find everywhere being talked about. But he talked about three more archetypes, the self which basically governs the process of individuation that is useful and creative aspect of the unconscious okay, and is made of productive and conscious, conscious experiences. He talked about persona which basically reflects the way the people wishes to be perceived by others and the shadow archetype which basically is the animal instinct inherited in all of us. Then came uh, Eric Erickson, his proposition is what is called as search for ego integrity. And if you remember Freud talked about uh, five stages, uh, oral, anal, phallic, latency and genital stage. Erickson talked about okay, the stages of development which is basically equivalent to the psychosexual development, okay. but he said that all stages have both psychosexual as well as psychosocial aspects of growth and change. Okay. And he gave a longer list, he said that the first stage is the stage of infancy that is the first year. Now this corresponds to the oral stage given by Freud, but Freud's oral stage was 0 to 2 years, okay. whereas uh, Erickson says that infancy basically is of only 1 year. Then Erickson's second stage is the early childhood stage which is 2 to 3 years and this corresponds with the anal stage that Sigmund Freud had proposed. But remember Freud's uh, uh, no, uh, anal stage was 2 to 3, okay. but 0 to 2 was the in, uh, oral stage. No? So there is little uh, no, uh, separation here in the sense that uh, infancy has been given only 1 year whereas 2 to 3 years, the 2 is, uh, year of longer period has been given to the anal stage. Uh, of Freud and according to Erickson this is the early childhood period. Then 4 to 6 year of age Freud stopped at 5 years, no? he said 3 to 5 was a phallic stage for him. But Erickson says that 4 to 6 year is what he called as play age, then he says school age which basically corresponds to the latency stage proposed by Freud which is 6 to 11 years of age, then adolescence which corresponds to the fifth stage that is uh, the, uh, the genital stage 12 to 13 or 19 years of age. So somewhere between 12 and 13 it starts goes up to 19 and then according to Erickson the three stages which follows are young adulthood which is roughly 20s, the middle adulthood which is 30 to 60, 65 years of age and then the maturity stage, the last stage is maturity, the onset is 65 and it goes up to death of the individual. Now uh, besides talking about you know, ego integrity, the focus that Erickson also laid was on identification with the model, okay. means how we identify models in our life and then we uh, keep shifting our goals. Okay with attainment of more and more clarity in terms of values. Okay. So this was an interesting thing and if you want to you know, draw a parallel little later when we come to the behaviorist approach, okay, there again you know, we will be coming to imitation and shaping, modeling. Okay. So you would realize that you know, there was a gradual shift from the neo Freudian approach to the other approach that was taken uh, to explain personality of human beings. Then came Karen Hornai. Karen Hornai's you know, proposition is called the psychoanalytic interpersonal theory. She talked about basic anxiety and basic hostility. According to her, basic anxiety arises in childhood when the child feels very, very helpless in this threatening world. Okay. So the perception is the world is threatening, the feeling is that I am helpless and this becomes a source of anxiety for the child this is what she calls as basic anxiety. 
The second uh, concept that she launched was the concept of basic hostility, where she says that usually this is uh, accompanied by basic anxiety and grows out of resentment over the parental behavior that led to anxiety in the first place. Means, as a child you hold your parent responsible for making you helpless, feel helpless in this threatening world and you resent to it. So, when situation uh, know that made you anxious, when you resent to it and you keep repeating your resentment, you keep reflecting your resentment, this is what Hornay call that, calls that this is basic hostility. She talked about three models of social behavior, where in one case you move towards others, what she refers as excessive compliance. When you move against others, what she says that this is satisfaction through ascendance and dominance of others. And third she says moving away from others, which she refers as this is self protection by the method of withdrawal. So, this was all about uh, the psychoanalytic approach to understanding of human personality. We would now be coming to the other very, very dominant uh, school of thought, the behaviorist uh, thought. Okay. And we would initially uh, talk about Dollard and Miller and then we will come to the Skinnerian uh, approach and finally, we would be talking about Albert's Bandura's model. Dollard and uh, Miller's uh, viewpoint is what is called as early social learning uh, approach. Basically, uh, they attempted testing the Freudian concept of neurotic behavior in lab on rats and finally, they translated the concept of psychoanalysis into learning theories. Okay, that is the reason why we are referring to this here. But the major uh, you know, understanding of uh, personality of individual came out of the proposition of B. F. Skinner. We have uh, gone through his uh, proposition in at length when we were going through learning. He talked about operant conditioning, okay, uh, talking about reinforcement and he also talked about the schedule of reinforcement, no? when he talked about fixed ratio, variable ratio, fixed interval and variable interval schedules. Okay. Just to uh, recapitulate what we discussed uh, when we were talking about learning and uh, reinforcement, fixed ratio schedule basically means that reinforcement is given after every fixed number of responses. In variable ratio schedule, no number of response are fixed for presentation of the reinforcement. In fixed interval uh, schedule, Reinforcement is given after a lapse of certain time. So, it has not to do with the number of response, rather it has to do with the time lag. And then the last was the variable interval schedule, where there is no fixed interval for reinforcement. Now, if you uh, try to map it to our life experiences, okay, those experiences in our life that act as reinforcement to us those life experiences, which basically uh, know, induces a sense of aversion in us. Okay. And how frequently did they get repeated? Okay. Were our response in that very situation reinforced? You can very easily map your early life experiences on these uh, schedules of reinforcement. Okay. And you can then think that why is it that I got conditioned to respond to a given set of things in life in a very, very particular way. Okay. Now, Skinner's viewpoint of operant conditioning, of course, after rat and PGNC demonstrated uh, you know, operant conditioning in human babies as well. But think of your own life experiences and think of the reinforcement that you got in life. Think of uh, you know, the aversions that you received in your life. So, both positive and negative type of uh, scenarios that you experienced okay, and the situations wherein you responded and uh, the type of response that you got positive or negative feedback from the environment, you can map it very nicely to the schedule of reinforcement. And then you can think that in fact, you start repeating only those behavior which you realize uh, know, were reinforced by the environment behavior which was not reinforced by the environment, you actually started curtailing on that, you reduced 
reflecting such type of responses in life. But the most important thing that Skinner talks about which can very easily be mapped to development of persona is shaping. Now, the behavior of the organism is gradually shaped, it is molded through the process of successive approximation. So, we have selective reinforcements in our life, certain responses are reinforced, certain responses are not reinforced, we follow the pattern of successive approximation and gradually we are molded, we are shaped and what shape finally we take is what you can call that this is our personality. Now, for example, now you can take examples of superstitious behavior when it develops due to accidental reinforcement. Now, initially what happens that there are certain vaguely reinforced type of behavior okay, which is given to some person. Say for instance, if your parents, if your caregivers, they were vaguely reinforcing your behavior according to what they thought you should be. Okay. And then what happens? that once you establish that type of a behavior because of this reinforcement, you search for variation that would come very closer to what you wanted. Okay. And this is what gives you a very unique touch. Okay. And of course, Skinner also talked about behavior modification. Now, behavior modification and shaping, these two concepts if you match it, basically what would happen that you can think of designing culture which would automatically you know reward good things and the bad elements in the society will gradually get extinguished. So, today we talked about uh, the behaviorist viewpoint, we could not uh, talk about Albert Bandura's uh, uh, proposition of modeling. So, when we meet next we would be talking about one important behaviorist model given by Albert Bandura, we would be talking about how modeling plays an important role in our life.